Hey, this is Castle Searcy, creative strategist out of Denver, Colorado in New York City, guest hosting for Film Talk Radio. Today we have the actor of film and television, Marty Lindsay, joining us from Atlanta right now. Marty is known for Better Call Saul, Big Sky, The Chosen, The Preacher, Preacher, just Preacher, Sicario, and so much more. Marty, welcome to Film Talk Radio. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What else are you known for? Can you give your bio? Oh, well, honestly, I started out doing a lot of independent film. I mean, that's, I really cut my teeth doing smaller films. And, and anybody who knows kind of this independent film world, um, there's a few really notable ones like the movie Ink, I-N-K. Uh, that was huge. And that was all made in Denver by Jamin Winans, Jamin and Kiowa Winans, uh, two super talented filmmakers. Uh, they That movie has probably had, has given me, um, well, it's given me some street cred in the sci-fi fantasy <laughs> world. Um, and what they accomplished with it was just so, it was just insanely cool. So yeah, um, you know, I've done, for those of you in New Mexico, because this is a New Mexico podcast, right? So uh, the show, uh, The Night Shift, I was on when that was being shot in New Mexico. Uh, the Messengers was another one I did. Uh, Manhattan, which was a great series about the Manhattan Project. And we got a lot of buzz about Oppenheimer and and uh, and I, I, I loved it, but I also loved Manhattan. I mean, I, that show was so good. And the writing and the cast, um, I just thought was just fantastic. And, and we just talked about the potential for me on uh, Stranger Things as a scientist. I played a scientist on on uh, Manhattan. And I said, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, I want to pull that footage and send it to Stranger Things, but. Would you be wearing glasses as a yeah, scientist? Yeah, you know, of course. Yeah. It's a prerequisite. Right, right. Uh, yeah. I know, I, I've, I've said, I, there's a few people here in Atlanta that I've, I've told about you know, stranger things and, and they're and like, yeah, it's a scientist. Like, oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, you're going to get that. I mean, you look like a scientist. Yeah. Scientist, <laughs> so. doctor. Um, I've seen you play like religious figures, like the, the, yeah. the chosen. The chosen. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, Wild West, like cowboys, like those. I things. do. I know. I tapped into the cowboy. I, the but you do. You really look like all those things. Yeah. Yeah. I can I can really dig deep into the into the two cowboy western characters. My dad was kind of a cowboy, and uh, I think every time I go do something like that, like I did Outlaws and Angels in uh, in New Mexico, that got into <clears throat> Sundance. Right. So went to Sundance in two thousand. I think it was seventeen. I believe. So that was a really cool experience, but yeah, I mean, every time I play like a a a Western type character, it's I'm playing a version of my dad. Yeah, cool. So yeah, yeah, because you, I think that's how I yeah. think of you. I think of you in the Western way. So. Yeah, I so did a, a a little uh, a short called Daydreams of Dennis Baker. And I play a sheriff, kind of Jasper, Alabama sheriff. And it's all kind of POV. He's sitting at a desk, or not POV, but it, you you only see him. He's, he's, he's like being interviewed, but you never see who's on the other side. And he's recalling a case that is now being reopened, a case that really affected his, you know, his everything that like consumed his life very true detective kind of has a true detective thing to it but i had a few friends from the south go 
this is this is good and and also your accent like you you got it like you, it it sounds natural and that's a big deal because a lot of western like you and i western folks here they call them north right you're from the north Northern. you know it's it's, yeah. it's a north south yeah. it's never east west yeah yeah <laughs> and i i keep saying i'm like no i'm from the west i'm i'm quite literally due west of right. of here so um yeah but people from the south really have a hard time when actors can't get the accents right so that was that was a, that was good for me yeah yeah, yeah. So you are from colorado or what's your origin story you're from <laughs> origin story yeah. uh grew up in utah actually salt lake city utah uh up until around see 14 or 15 we moved to Colorado, Arvada, and then so junior high, high school, college was all in Colorado, and then I ended up going to um, well, so col so college was Fort Lewis College in Durango, and I came back and went to Metro State. Uh, kind of Metro State and the University of Colorado was all on one uh, campus, so the theater departments were. Uh, sort of intertwined and I was so I was doing theater then and that's when I was studying theater and and really becoming like okay do I want to be an actor kind of thing it started at Fort Lewis and then I kind of kept going with it in Denver and uh then I ended up in in LA at 20 I was what 27 uh so I spent a lot of time for well, something like seven or eight years in, in LA. And then came back to Colorado, lived in New York for a year, started up, I came back to Denver. Denver's always been, you know, home. And it's, you know, it's where my family is and my mom and my, I've got two brothers there with their families and they've got, they've got kids. And then uh, I got another brother in, in Arkansas. So, but I've lived in New Mexico twice. First time was about a two year long stint. So it was like 2015, 16 into 17, I believe. I think I've got the dates right. And then I spent all of 2021 in, in New Mexico when I was doing Big Sky. And uh, what else was I doing out there? I feel like I'm leaving something out. I just better call Saul. Oh yeah, back on Saul. That's right. I don't know how I could forget that. Yep. Yeah, Saul was supposed That's to be one. a couple of episodes, mm -hmm. um, which I was super excited about. That final season, season six, and they kind of reduced these two characters, my character and the other uh, lawyer. I don't know what you call us, like a junior lawyer. They whittled it down to just one big scene, and and it's a it's a doozy of a scene. Even though we don't have a lot of dialogue, we spent like three days shooting one one scene because it's so big. It was I think it was a total. I had to have been about a tw at least a twelve to thirteen minute long scene, and. For, for TV, and if you know TV, sounds like your audience here does. I mean, that's just is an insane amount amount to have to uh, shoot and you know it all at once. So, do you have any stories from working on the Better Call Saul set? Okay. Yeah, I mean, that first season was there was the stakes were super high and. Jeff Pomeroy and I, the other lawyer, and uh, Dennis Butzakaris plays our, our boss. And all of our scenes were going to be with Bob Odenkirk and Michael McKeon. Uh, there was one big scene, back to another big scene. Like, there was never any, like, you know, it felt like there was no just anything quick. Um, at in, in Chuck, his character's name is, uh, Michael's character's name is Chuck in his house at like a, a big uh, 
you know, dining room table. So it's a five of us. And um, the way Better Call Saul does it, a lot of shows do it this way. Not, not all shows do it this way, but a lot of them do, is you shoot continuously. So um, they set up a shot, and then let's say it's on Bob, and, and Bob goes through the whole scene. And I, I believe that scene was 10, I'm almost positive, it's at least ten pa eight to 10 pages. So that's eight to 10 minutes. And they do his coverage and then they move to another character. They do, you know, they, they start with a master and then they move in on like two shots and then move in on, on singles. And you do the whole scene from top to bottom every single time. Uh, you, they, you don't stop. I had like a line and then there was like all this dialogue and these long speeches and then a line, all this dialogue these long speeches. And at one point during some of the coverage on like my second line, I just couldn't remember it. <laughs> I, I, it was, it would not come out of my mouth. And the first time I screwed it up, I, and it was just one line, you know, I, I had like almost like a panic attack. I mean, I, I literally started sweating and I, I my hands were shaking and, so I didn't know what was going on. Honestly, I, I, I've asked myself that question a million times since then. I never thought after that, <laughs> after that, I'm like, there was one line. Yeah. I, I could not figure out like, you feel like you're, uh, you, you have like a neurological disorder or something <laughs> and the synapses are not firing correct because I had just done the exact same thing. I don't know how many times before, but uh, we we got through that day and it was, there was a lot, you could feel the, the tension. I just had this conversation like a couple of nights ago. Somebody was asking me about my experience on Saul and um, a friend here in, in Atlanta. And the you could just feel the tension in the studio. Also, who the who are who the heck are you guys? Like, you know, we know Dennis. Obviously, there's Michael. Like, who are these two guys? You know, who, you know. So we felt uh, both Jeff and I definitely felt the the the, the pressure yeah. to step into the ring, a big ring, like I, arguably at the time the biggest ring uh, on on TV because of the um you know the the follow-up to breaking bad the pre the prequel to breaking bad i think um you know they didn't know i mean how do you know how do you know it's gonna you know perform as well as breaking bad so so anyway we get through that day and we get to the end of of that massive day and um we break, I immediately stand up and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I don't know what the hell happened to me. I don't know what happened. I feel awful. I am yeah. sorry, I can't, I, you know? And they kind of started chuckling and 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 that made me feel a little bit better. Um, and Bob came up to me and said, hey, I was on Saturday Night Live for X amount of seasons. I, I was a writer and they also would put me in sketches. Inevitably, I would always have one line and almost every single one, I would screw up that line. <laughs> and, and I was like, I, I don't know what happened to me, but thank you for telling me that story <laughs> because I think I needed, I needed to hear that. Uh, but yeah. it, it, it's, it's tough when you're not in the sort of rhythm of speak, especially with that kind of writing, and then you've got to like jab in a line. It's hard to catch up to the, to, I mean, it, it is. Acting is very much like music. I mean, you get it, you get into the flow of the dialogue and um, it becomes uh, more fluid. And so, it is. It's one of the hardest things to do. 
I honestly, it's to, to do one line. That's all you have to do to, you know, kind of get. So it was like a double header of like COVID and then the strike and, and then just yeah. like what all of us creatives and freelancers face is mm -hmm. where, where's my next job coming from? And you right. Know, and yeah. Well. And like, how but, do you, I mean, just how do you deal with that in general? Some people I think are better at it than others, or some people have developed skills or tools to to deal with that kind of lifestyle. You know? Yeah, um, I, I I'm becoming I'm becoming less and less uh, sort of a fan of that kind of lifestyle. It, I, it's a it's a young person's way of going about it you know bouncing around and you know sleeping on couches when you have to and friends houses and stuff like that but um yeah you know i've also done a lot of other things as far as you know i've, I've done i've been a teacher uh, i've also been behind the camera a lot and directed a bunch of things i've directed commercials and um, i've written a ton I'm about ready to release a book called um, "It's a Book of Scenes and Monologues for Kids and Adults." So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm gonna um, self uh, release it, just like on Amazon. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's gonna be—it's a lot of material for what will more than likely go to like acting schools, but. I think anybody who would like to read a bunch of different genre of scenes and read monologues, uh, I, I brought it up to a friend who I'm actually going to see tonight, um, who's a writer, and she said, "I, I want to read this." Yeah, you know? I, do, so, I do too. Yeah, yeah. so I, I'm excited to, yeah, to get it out. Questions. Yeah. It's almost all together. It's almost all, almost all done. But it's years and years of writing for, uh, mainly writing for teens and tweeners, and adults. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm just constantly having to adapt. Somebody said this. It was the drummer for John Cougar. I can't remember his name for John for for John Mellencamp, and they were interviewing him about an album. And how he like he, he was talking about how we had to evolve. And he said, he's like, you either adapt or you die. And, and that has stuck with me. Yeah. So ever since I listened to that interview. Yeah. So you do, you have to, you you just constantly have to adapt and take risks and not stay stuck in the in the in, in the easy um you know, even me getting out to Atlanta was a big like hurling of myself off the cliff. So that's what I was yeah. like deciding where you're gonna be, you know, you're like choosing yeah. the path, you know, like yeah, and you don't know as far as I came to Atlanta, signed with an agency, thought I would hit the ground running. I've got a lot of credits, so they come with some weight for sure. And there's Marvel stuff going on. Clint Eastwood has a movie being, you know, being done when I first got here in May. And um, and then the strike happens. Then the, the WGA strikes and then SAG after right after that went on strike. So it's kind of like, oh boy, now 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 what do I do? So I I mean, if anything, I I know what I um can handle. Uh, also what you know i know what i can't handle and so i think this the next maybe three to six months are going to be a, a massive uh sort of reflection of maybe the, the the rest of my life to be honest with you because you know i've got to start booking some bigger jobs i'm starting to, to turn down some things which is a really strong indication of where i am and kind of like where I am with my craft, where I am with like my my psychology with the industry, and um, absolutely what I will not do anymore, I will not go backwards, mm -hmm. and um, what what I'm trying to manifest for the next phase of my of my career because I think at some point every actor, especially actors, 
you have to decide, okay, I'm ready for that. I, 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 I need to be there. I, I know what that is. And that's where I'm supposed to be in Ohio. Uh, just, I mean, w without those, honestly, I don't even know. It would have been, it, 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 it's, it's already tough to be an actor and make a living. But um, I think a lot of actors blew through savings and credit cards. And it was, it's, it was rough. It was really rough. And even getting around actors at that time, friends who are actors, you know, it's almost like we didn't even want to talk about it because it was just too hard. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's like, it's not just the elephant in the room. It's like nine, you know, elephants in the room mm -hmm. that you don't want to address because it's so hyper present. You know, you go a month in this industry without working, let alone six it's devastating. So something that's not talked about enough. I don't know why we don't talk about it enough. I don't know why it's not really, you know, like what we, what we went through, you know, um, cause it was like COVID again, but there was no relief fund with the strike. Everybody was scrambling to do whatever they, they, whatever they had to do. Um, but I just, what I just advice keep... would you have for people getting started and acting now, like knowing all that you've doing this for how long? You know, I, yeah, I've been doing it really the professional. I think I, I always think like when I got out to LA, so at like 90, 96, 97. So yeah, I'm, I'm going on 25 plus years of, of doing this. But those first few, two, three years uh, in LA, you know, it was just a grind. I really didn't do much. Booked a couple of things, you know, a few things, but not not much. Um, my advice, honestly, I, it, it used to be one thing. And it used to be, you do have to drop the hammer. Get an education, have some type of job that you can, you know, you can do. Um, like Dustin Hoffman on the inside the actor's studio said this one thing that really bothered me for so long. And it was a question from the students, from the audience, uh, one of the audience members or one of the students. And his answer, I can't remember the exact question, but his answer was, it, you know, if it's just about the job, you will die. And I'm like, when I first saw it, I was like, well, of course it's just about the job. So what, what are you talking about? Of course it's about, like, it is about the job, you know, like it's a hundred percent about the job, but the past year or so, I know what he meant <laughs> that if, if it's just about booking an acting job, you're, you will you'll die you you it will it will eat you alive because there's just not enough work there's not enough work there's not enough um opportunity for all of us to do what it is that we we're good at we're talented at and also um what what we love to do you have to have other things going on in your life to balance out you know family relationships friends um, hopefully a, a place on this earth that feels right. And that's always been Denver for me. Um, I'm so affected by an environment. So. Um, and how would you compare, like you've worked in Hollywood or been, lived in Hollywood, New Mexico, Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, Denver, obviously. I'm not sure where yeah. else. But as far as working in the film and television industry, like what is different? Um, well, I love New Mexico. I, 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 the last time I lived there in 21, I thought I'm going to stay here. I'm not, uh, I'm not going into other, in any other market, that market, I get really great opportunities with, you know, the casting directors all know me. They call me in for, you know, the bigger roles that are being done, you know, really, I've got, I've had massive opportunity in new mexico plus i love new mexico 
Mm-hmm. Me too. I like uh, I, I like Albuquerque. I know everybody loves Santa Fe, you know, because of, it's uh, Santa Fe is kind of like the you know the other side of you know like Albuquerque is like the other side of the tracks, but it's a, it's a very real place. But there was a ton of opportunity in New Mexico, and I would stay. In fact, I got a New Mexico driver's license. That says a lot about like, oh, I'm going to stay here. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, New Mexico, um, th- the work is so sporadic. So you have to, again, it's like when you have the big gap, what do you do? There's stuff going on in Atlanta. Okay, there's stuff shot going on in Utah. And uh, I'm, I have a stronghold in Colorado, you know, like, do I go back to Colorado? So you're, you're constantly trying to, to fill in, uh, fill in the gaps. And that's where, for me, the next phase of my career is actually on a show. And I, I, that's what I keep saying is like, I'm, I'm going to end up on a show as a regular and get, get a run. That's because I really want the, I'm, craving needing all of it man trying to manifest that um that routine so but otherwise you're looking at any of the other markets including la but la has turned into a a place where they really want you to live there too so if you're getting hired as a as a local you know there's a lot of people who fudge the the local part of it and say they live in LA, but really they live in Montana or Colorado or wherever. And so they are, because their tax incentive is predicated on someone being local, just like New Mexico, just mm-hmm. like Georgia, um, and any of the states, you have to be, you have to be local. So yeah, you know, um, each market is different. Atlanta is a tough nut to crack. I think there's an old guard here. I think they have a hard time with new people. At least that's been my experience, especially new people who have got a, a strong proven track record. And so it's been a little bit of a, a little bit of a challenge, but there's been other extenuating circumstances with the strike that, you know, I'm trying to give it a chance and and uh, hopefully it will give me a chance. And you left New Mexico because like there was a break in work or? No. So honestly, um, I was having, <laughs> this is, I was having really bad allergies. I think we talked about this yeah, okay. at Forest Room one, one night. Uh, and it's not just, you know, pollen and, and sneezing. It was, I was having some respiratory issues and it was making me asthmatic and I'm not, I don't have asthma. So um that second year so i was there all of 21 into the beginning of 2022 uh, right around mid-february i started having it started to happen again and i'm like what do i do so i went to an allergist you can get the shot and she she's like well option two is you leave because wow. Yeah. The way it is here from February to about May, once the it chills out, it's the juniper tree. I know the culprit, it's the juniper tree, um, which is a survivor tree. And what it gives out like in the spring is just so hard on a lot of people. I've, I see the people when I'm in Albuquerque, the ones who are really struggling. I'm like, oh, wow. So this is a thing. This is a real thing. So that's why I left. Honestly, that was like the reason why I left. And I would be there and kind of just deal with it with, you know, albuterol or whatever. 